Good evening and welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. Let's all stand. If you are able, we're going to sing our first song, page number 331, Surely Goodness and Mercy. A pilgrim was I and a wandering. In the cold night of sin I did roam. When Jesus the kind shepherd found me. And now I am on my way home. Surely goodness and mercy shall find. of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. On that second life. verse. He restoreth my soul when I'm weary. He giveth me strength day by day. He leads me beside the still waters. He guards me each step of the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow days, all the days of my On that life. last verse, when I walk through that dark, lonesome valley, my Savior will walk with me there, and safely his great hand will lead me to the mansions he's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. All the days, all the days of my life. Amen. You may be seated as we open up in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for today. Lord, I just thank you for all that you do. I thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. God, we just thank you for another night to be in your house. Uh, Lord, we're just thankful for another night to sing praises to your name and uh, pray, hear preaching. God, we're just so thankful for how good you are. Lord, we pray that you please just uh, uh, continue to bless. Lord, we're just thankful for, uh, Lord, getting to celebrate the 4th of July this last weekend. Lord, we're thankful for the country we live in. Lord, we're thankful for the religious freedoms that we have. Uh, Lord, I pray, please just protect those freedoms, God, but I pray it help us also not to take them for granted, God. Uh, Lord, I pray, please just bless the remainder of our service here tonight. Uh, we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise, and we ask all this in the wonderful, holy, and precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Missionary of the week is the is Mark Helgerman family. They're missionaries to Papua New Guinea, and um, we received these new prayer um, cards from the Jertbergs. Um, we got them in the mail today, and we've put them in the prayer bulletins here. So just make sure you, um, you know, if you take it, take the time to read through it and um, pray for them um, as they minister there in Madagascar. So um, you can put that in your fridge or on a, use it as a bookmark. Um, so praise the Lord for the Jertbergs. But we have the June and July 2020 um, letter here for the Helgermans, and it reads, To God be the glory, so much to thank Him for. And not enough space, but there are a few praises. One main prayer for our welfare was for was 
was for Father to supply food for our family during the COVID-19 virus stage, siege. The story, was, the story was similar to the ravens coming to feed Elijah. By the middle of May 4th, flights, one from Karima and, and some food and cash, a second from Ayura with fuel and hardware to finish some of the church building, and a third and fourth out of Port Moresby with fuel, food, and other miscellaneous supplies, more than 1,000 pounds of food and about 2,000 pounds of gas slash diesel, all this without leaving the jungle. Thanks to the help of Dr. John Gray in Karima, Matt Allen in Port Moresby, and several and several other several other friends in Yukarumpa. We haven't missed any meals and always had enough money to buy garden food at the local market. The awareness given by the government officials in King Kintibo were not always forthcoming or true. Several new policemen were sent to Kintiba to keep people in line and give weekly updates. At the first, our family was trying to help by passing on the current status and laws for the Gulf province to the officials. They refused the help, stating they did not want anything that came from Facebook. The fact of the matter was we did not download it from Facebook. What we did receive came directly from the controller, the police commissioner, for all the Papua New Guinea. Oh well, at least we tried. Other awareness was off the wall like, if a person dies from COVID-19, they will glow. Wow, and that was from a health department worker that had just returned with the latest information from Karima. Ultimately, there, were much, there was much fear put into the heart of the people and it did the work, and it did the work it was intended. No one went anywhere on their normal nor nomadic treks for three months, the police put roadblocks on all of the footpaths leading in and out of Cantiba. How many years of unraveled work of, for, of praying for peace in our community undone in short few days. But through much preaching, the truth, praying, and giving the true awareness of several ways to prevent the sickness, things are finally back to Cantiba normal. We do thank Father that his wisdom, wisdom trumps all the gainsayings of the, of the heathen. Thank you all for your prayer concerning our family as it relates to this COVID-19 out in the deep, dark jungle. We are in continued prayer for you all there in the USA also. Just about, just about a week ago, another unique thing happened. Since the new church building has a good place to study and read in quiet, to study and read in quiet, I often resort there to do office work on the porch. This veranda is situated facing the road and is a good place to talk to people as they walk by, also, walk by also, well, one afternoon I was sitting there and a snake was trying to vacate the church as I sat near the door. As our eyes met, the snake hesitated, not knowing if, it, if to leave the building completely or return back inside. As I stood to slay the beast, it decided to return within again. Not wanting this serpent to leave without repentance, I pursued the creature to no avail. It refused to repent and soon thereafter it was slain. It measured over four feet in length. It was not a poisonous snake, but that, it, but that it had the audacity to come into the church building without permission. My zeal boiled up to make it an example to all other snakes who would try to do such a thing. My heart goes out to all our many friends in the USA who are suffering in, other, in their own ways due to COVID-19 and riots in various places. We do pray often for you all to be strong and courageous and to be strong and encourage yourselves in the promises of God's word, please do not despair, for our peace cometh down from the Father of light. He is our stronghold in these trying times. And then um, his wife has this, what they call the Christi, Christie's Corner, and she writes, I have now begun a new class of literacy students. This time, ten ladies are attending. Two, two from my former class wanted to go through again as they weren't reading well. It has been good. It, it has been going good so far. We have completed five lessons Pray for these ladies that they would grasp the ability to read. I try to impress on them that my main goal is that they can read God's word for themselves. And uh, that's the uh, Helgerman family. Pray for them. They have five children. And uh, just pray for their safety as they're out there, that God will continue to supply their needs, and that God would uh, give them a harvest of souls. Uh, if you're watching via Facebook and you have a prayer request, just go ahead and leave it in the comments section and we'll uh, make sure that we add it to the prayer list. Um, we've been updating the prayer list every day because of the 
the noon Zoom prayer meeting that we've been doing, and, and that started as a result of the, um, the pandemic a uh, couple of months back. And so, um, you know, the prayer list has been updated. We had a prayer list out there on Sunday morning, and it's already been changed a few times since then. So uh, I want to just list some of the changes that are on there. First of all, let me mention the family of the week this week, and that hasn't changed as the Foreman family. That's Roy and Verna. And then we just uh, had the prayer letter from Mark and Christy Helzerman, missionaries to Papua New Guinea. And then the ministry of the week is the First Impressions team, and they're the people out in the parking lot, and also the people that greet uh, folks at the door, including now the people that take uh, the temperatures and all that kind of stuff. So uh, listed on here, we have James and Bob, Joe, Stephanie, and Peggy. And then the church of the week is uh, Miracle Ridge Baptist Church in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania. That's Pastor Doug Knight. And Doug is a Galloway boy. He, he was uh, born and raised here. I uh, was a member of Mainland Baptist Church, and then he um, took a church out there in uh, the Pittsburgh area, actually. And uh, my wife and I went out there for their Valentine banquet last year. And so pray for him, pray for his wife, Jessica. They have, I think, three children. And um, Doug's mom, Jean, is on the prayer list also under, under specific health requests. And uh, she's got some kind of serious health issue. We're just not sure uh, what it is. But anyway, if you would pray for Jean. Um, I'm not sure if her last name is Knight or not. But anyway, it's, it's Pastor Knight's mom. Um, Brother Bob uh, went for some blood tests and things today. And he found out that he has, he's been having some pain in his foot. And he found out he's got arthritis in his foot. And so if you would pray for Brother Bob. Uh, and he's got, uh, you know, other health issues as well. Uh, we've been praying for Sherry, Sherry Moore, um, uh, and her sister's Patty, and um, she, uh, she's been going for a series, I think uh, she's had three biopsies, she's got one more to go. The first two she got results back for, and they both came back negative, um, so she had another one uh, two days ago, and she didn't get the results back for that one, and she's got another one she's got to go for. Um, in the future. It's not scheduled yet. So if you would pray for Sherry that they continue to come back negative. Um, Caitlin asked for prayer. My daughter-in-law, Caitlin in Texas, asked for prayer. She had a job interview today and, um, and she wants, uh, it's at a, um, some kind of a Christian school or daycare or something like that. And uh, anyway, it would be a really good fit for them. And, uh, but anyway, pray if it's God's will that she gets the job. And then Jen Ferrucci, uh, asked for prayer for her family because they just lost their uncle for bereavement. And then she asked, also asked for prayer for her health. And uh, let's see, on the other side here, um, Bob Houck had a procedure um, on Monday, so keep him in your prayer. Um, uh, also, uh, Rachel Peretti had a, um, a procedure today, I think it was, and uh, so pray for her. Scott Ibsen, he's out in Colorado. He used to be a member of Solid Rock Baptist Church. But um, Scott Ibsen, is, uh, he's got cancer. He's in really, really bad shape. His son Kyle is getting married on Saturday. And Scott's in the hospital, and it doesn't look like he's going to make it. Um, so they're, they're praying that he would be able to make it to his son's, um, his son's uh, wedding. And so pray about that whole thing. It's got to be bittersweet, obviously, for his kids as well because, you know, you're you know, it's not, you know, you're joy joyous about the wedding, but, you know, it's, it's not good because you're, you're, you know, your dad is in the condition that he's in. Um, underneath the COVID requests, pray for uh, Ronnie. He's on the top of the list there, Ronnie and Mary. Now, they're down in Texas, not in um, where Phil is uh, in the immediate area, but they're related to, to Caitlin somehow. And, um, but anyway, a while back, if you've been following on the prayer list, a while back, um, the, Mr. Holt uh, came down with COVID in Dallas, Texas. He was, he was at the hospital for treatment for cancer, and he caught the virus, and he, got, and he died uh, from the virus. And he, of course, he had a lot of other, he had cancer and, and other health issues, and he was up there in years. But um, his daughter, Renee, who is Phil's, Caitlin's aunt, her, she got it, and, uh, and her husband, uh, Harold, got it. They're on the list as well, Harold and Renee. Now, they're completely clear of the COVID 
uh, that was several months ago, uh, Janie Holt, who was the husband of the guy that died, she's completely clear also, but they, they're all dealing with these residual side effects from it. They're having trouble breathing, and, and so pray for them. They're very weak. Uh, I read an article in um, on my news feed on my phone, a guy who had the virus a couple of months ago early on and recovered from it, but he said that um, uh, he still deals with weakness and, he, and, and the cough is kind of persistent, though now you know, he's been testing negative for quite a while. So anyway, um, so pray for Ronnie. Also pray for uh, Pastor Black. That's a church in Oklahoma who's got the virus. And uh, Wade and Elizabeth's grandfather goes to that church, uh, Lou Thompson, and his wife, Jean. Pray for protection for them that they don't get it. Uh, also pray for um, Giovanni. Giovanni is Kai's boyfriend. And he's the guy that just trusted Christ as a savior last week via a conference call that we had set up and praise the Lord for that but he's in real bad shape he's on a ventilator and I don't know at last um, check he was at like 60% oxygen so pray for him and then also uh, pray for Sarah Giroud James out in the parking lot I think James is out in the parking lot James's wife is due I think Sunday um, so and I don't know I'm sure James could answer that question better than I could you know, what do you do? I mean, is he allowed to go in the room with her? I don't know what the rules are now. Um, you know, with COVID, uh, I got to be perfectly honest with you. If they told me that I couldn't be in the room, I would say, oh, gee. Now, I'll just, I'll, I'll just wait outside. It's, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I know my, my brother told me, he said, Phil, it's the greatest experience you'll ever experience in your life. And uh, I said, yeah, it was great, but I'll pass on the next three children though so uh, anyway uh, everybody's different so uh, so anyway pray for pray for Sarah uh, that's their second child so pray that everything goes well with that there's also by the way uh, four more ladies uh, expecting Dawn um, that's uh, Bubby's wife uh, Foster uh, Jessica Hicks that's Gerald his wife my my daughter uh, Melissa and then also um, Nikki is Linda's, and she's to Wednesday, next Wednesday. Yeah, so a week from today. Yeah, so she's due also. So yeah, pray for Nikki as well. And her last name, you can just call her Dempsey, but it's Schulenkamp or something, right? Did I say that right? Schulenkamp. So I don't know why you would want to trade a name like Dempsey for Schulenkamp, but it is what it is. All right, so those are the, the updates on it. And we'll take uh, just a moment to pray. And obviously, as we've been doing with the, um, with the, uh, the noon Zoom, we, we can't pray over the entire list. I try to, uh, through a series of meetings, cover the new request and also cover some of the, um, you know, the more, imp not more important, they're all important, but some of the highlights and uh, some of the people that are in more serious need. And, you know, I just try to cover also sections. So... Uh, anyway, let's just ask the Lord to bless and um, these needs on the prayer, li prayer list. And I, and I would ask you also, you know, take the prayer list. It's on the website. Uh, by the way, for those of you watch, I mentioned Facebook. If you're watching via the live stream on the website, uh, up on the top, there's a tab that says more. If you click on that tab and it's got prayer requests, you can, you know, put a prayer request on there. And I get an email immediately if you... Uh, send in a prayer request that way. We have a prayer um, chain text message. If you want interest, if you're interested in being a part of that, we have one for people who don't have iPhones and people who um, do have iPhones. And so, uh, so if if you're interested in that, you know, we're we're updating each other on prayer requests all the time. And so, there's a lot of different ways you can find out what's going on as far as the uh, the prayer. It's, it certainly is a lot better than years ago. Uh, the prayer change, you know, one person would find out and then they have to call and, you know, three hours later, everybody would find out about what was going on. Now it's instantaneous. So it's, it, technology's got its, got its problems, but there's some good stuff about it as well. So uh, anyway, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, God, for the opportunity to gather together as a church and pray. And we do ask God that you would just be uh, with our church service tonight. We pray, God, for the kids outside and the leaders that are working outside as well as you know, the safety team that's out there. God, just watch over, bless and protect them, keep them safe. We pray also, God, I understand that there's graduation across the street 
and uh, boy, it's a far cry from the graduations that we used to have here years ago, uh, where just about every parking spot in Galloway Township was taken up and people were parked all over the lawns and the roads and uh, it doesn't seem like it's that crowded over there. I'm sure they're, they're extremely limiting the number of people that can attend the graduation. And so God, I pray you'd bless the graduation. We're thankful for the graduates who did well and, and finished their course. God, we pray you'd bless them uh, as they move on to their next journey in life. And I'm, 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 uh, I, I'm, I pray for them because they, uh, they, they had a rough year with this COVID thing. And you know, it's, it's not the way I'm sure they expected to spend their senior year in high school. And, uh, but I guess we're all dealing with it as well, but we just pray for them. And God, we do pray that you would bless these needs on the prayer list. We pray for uh, Roy and Verna Foreman, Lord, bless them. And uh, God, they travel a lot. I know that uh, Verna's got family in, in Philadelphia. She's, she's out there quite often. And, and uh, George lives out down there in Texas. And so Roy's constantly going back and forth. And so just give them safety as they travel. And I know uh, Roy's business was kind of hurting because of um, the virus. And Lord, I pray you'd help with that. And we just pray you'd bless them and be with them. I pray for Brother and Mrs. Helzerman, Lord, and their ministry there in Papua New Guinea. Keep your hand upon them, Lord, and uh, that's got to be uh, a real difficult place to minister in when all this is going on. And I know they have to either walk places or they have to fly places uh, to get from island to island and from spot to spot. It's very remote and rugged. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would be with them. And I know they mentioned that they were having a tough time getting supplies. And we pray, Lord, that they would be able to get everything that they need. We pray also for our First Impressions team, the safety guys outside uh, that greet people in the parking lot. Joe and, and uh, Bob and, and, um, and James are out there all the time. And then we have the safety crew out there on top of them. And uh, Lord, we pray also for, for Stephanie and, and Peggy as they're greeting people at the front door. We just pray you'd be with them and bless them. God, we also pray for Brother Knight's church, uh, Miracle Ridge. And we pray, God, that you'd bless uh, Brother Knight's mom and be with her, Lord. We pray, God, for all these health needs, and we have a lot of people on the list that have cancer, and we pray especially, God, for Scott Ibsen, and uh, Scott's not part of our church, but he's uh, a lot of people we know and love, love him, and I think I've met him a few times when he, when he used to go to Solid Rock, but I really don't know him all that well. I've, I've heard great things about his testimony, even though he's in a lot of pain, and they say right now he's in, in, in agony. Uh, because the tumor has grown so large, it's causing so much pain in other places. And But it, through the whole thing, he's done nothing but praise you. And so, God, I pray that you would just bless him, be with his family as, as they're going through all this with him. And, God, I pray you'd work it out so he'd be able to be at his son's, at his son's wedding, Lord. And just, uh, God, just to make that happen, Lord. I pray for Rachel, Lord, who had a procedure today. I pray, God, that you would help her. I pray for um, Travis's dad. Uh, Jimmy Clark, who's uh, got a, a feeding tube put in now, and he's going to have it for the next couple of months. I pray, uh, God, you just help him to get used to that. It's got to be a real uncomfortable thing, and I pray you just bless him. I pray for Brother Bob and all that he's dealing with. Uh, you know, with uh, recently just found out he's got um, arthritis in his foot, and I know they were checking him for limes and some other things. I just pray, God, that you would just bless his health. I know he's a guy that just likes to stay busy, likes to keep moving. And we just pray you'd bless him, Lord. We pray for Ronnie, who has the virus, God. I, I know he's, he's been doing better, and we're thankful for that. I mean, for a while there, it didn't look good. And so we're thankful that he's doing better. We, we pray, God, you continue uh, to help him. We pray for all the other people, Pastor Black, who's got the virus, and Ashley and Angel. We pray for Yvonne, Lord, Kai's boyfriend, that you would bless him and help him. And God, be with Kai. It's very difficult for Kai. She can't. Uh, get into the hospital to see him. She can only see him via, you know, the phone calls, and, and they have him so sedated that uh, that she can't even do that. And so she has to find out everything through a nurse. And so, God, we just pray that you would just uh, bless her and comfort her as, as she's going through this with Yvonne. And we pray for Chris and Nick, and uh, we pray for Roman. I pray for Harold and Renee and Janie, Lord, not only because they lost um, their dad and her husband, but, God, they... They're, they're still very weak from the, the remnants of the virus. We pray for Butch and Abram and Lynette. And God, we do ask that you'd be with our health care workers, uh, especially the ones from uh, this church that work in health care. God, we pray for Joanna, that you would bless her and keep her safe. And we pray for Ann and Joe and Sarah and Stephanie. And we pray for my wife's cousin, Stephanie, and Linda, 
uh, Miss Dempsey, Lord, that you would just watch over her. And God, I pray that you would be with Paige, uh, Bob's granddaughter, and Dawn, and Christian, and Tiffany, and Mercedes, and Jamie, and Tammy, and Michelle, and Sully. And we pray for these ladies that are expecting, especially these two that are expecting this week. God, we pray you be with Sarah and be with Nikki as well and bless them. And God, I pray for um, these unspoken requests and uh, we've been praying for Markeisha. Markeisha's really going through a rough time. I pray, God, you bless her and help her and give her wisdom, God. Help her to know what to do. And I pray, God, that you would work in her family. And uh, God, I pray for uh, Pat and Keith, Lord, with their unspoken situation, Lord, that you would bless in that and Patty's. Pray for the Nivens family down in South Carolina. God, just be with them. I pray for Esan. Uh, Lord, with um, the job situation that he's been praying about, I just pray you'd work in that. I pray for Caitlin Tarr's request. And uh, Lord, we pray for the Guzman family. Uh, that's uh, Rich's co-worker, Juan, passed away very quickly. Found out he had cancer at the beginning of this pandemic and uh, not even at the beginning, probably a month after it started and then quickly passed away. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd be with his family. We pray for Wes and Melissa as they're, you know, they're, they want to close on their house at the end of the month. I pray that everything would go through smoothly. I pray, God, that you'd give them um, the answers to all the questions regarding the move to Alaska. Uh, everything's kind of crazy right now. You know, the ferry's shut down, and, and uh, they're trying to figure out how to get their stuff up there and not be up in Alaska without their stuff. And, and so, Lord, I just pray that you would just uh, put the pieces all together there. I pray for New Man of Baptist Church that they're having camp this week. And God, I pray you'd bless them. Be with Jason Garner, Lord, as he's uh, leading that camp and Brother Shirley. And I pray, God, for Rich and Tina, Lord. They want to see Kyle uh, before he gets uh, shipped off to South Korea. And God, I pray you'd bless him. Bless all our military, God. Be with um, Jimmy, Lord. Keep him safe. Bless him as well. And be with Tennyson and Wes and, and Shannon and Anthony. Uh, Lord, just watch over them. And God, we pray for this, uh, our service tonight, that you would bless this service. We pray, God, for the services coming up on Sunday. We're thankful, God, that um, we had more people at church this past Sunday. I think we had 82 uh, different people that came. And uh, a year ago, if I would have said that, I'd be depressed. But I was excited for 82 people because it's more than it was the weeks before. And slowly but surely, people are starting to come back to church and God, I pray that, that you would keep them safe, that you would put a hedge of protection over this place and over all the churches, God. It, wouldn't, it would not be good for the cause of Christ if all of a sudden there was a, a huge outbreak that kind of got traced back to one of our churches. And so, God, I pray you'd help us to, to be safe, to, to be smart. And, uh, but, God, as we've been saying over and over and over again, uh, your word tells us that the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord, and we're just trusting you, God, to give us the safety. We're going to be as careful as we can be, but, God, it's going to be up to you to keep us safe, and we pray you bless and help with that. And, uh, Lord, we pray for all the other high-risk workers out there. We pray, God, for the people struggling with uh, finances because they're laid off or, or whatever. God, I just pray you bless with all that. Uh, help our country, God. Give us unity. And, uh, God, I pray you bring revival to America. We need revival. Our, I need revival. Um, my family needs revival. This community, this church needs revival. And, God, I pray that you would do that. And, God, we'd have to add to that anything that, whatever it takes to bring us to revival. God, then that's what, if that's what you have to do to get us there, that's what needs to be done. And, uh, God, I'm asking that you would do that in my heart. And, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just bless Bless the church service tonight. Bless uh, the rest of the scene, the Bible study in Luke. And Lord, we love you. We're thankful for all that you do for us. For us in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. We're going to do our next song. Page number 463. 463, when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, Yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll 
I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise in the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Last song, if you're able, let's all stand as we sing our last song, page number 480, I Want That Mountain. Sing it out. I saw the giant of prayerlessness upon the mountain high. He laughed so hard at my amended knee. No longer in the wilderness I'll stay, and so I cry. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of escrow grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. There was a giant of laziness who said I wouldn't go and witness for the one who set me free. I'll come from out the wilderness, I'll witness now I know. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of estrel grow, I want that mountain, I want that mountain, the mountain that my Lord has given me. One faithless giant upon the crest of Hebron's lofty height has vowed that he's the one to make me flee. I'll climb from out the wilderness and trust Jehovah's might. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of escrow grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. Sing it out on that last verse. Let every giant of dumb distress and unbelief and sin get ready now to vacate for you see. I've come from out the wilderness. I know I'm going to win. I want that mountain. It belongs to me. I want that mountain. I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Esco grow. I want that mountain. I want that mountain, the mountain that my Lord has given me. Amen. You may be seated. Just a quick couple of announcements. Uh, just a reminder to sign up for our services, all, four, all five of our services, three on Sunday and then, excuse me, Three, one, yep, four services, three on Sunday and the Wednesday night Bible study. Make sure you sign up. Let us know how many of you will be here. That way we, we know how many of you will be coming. If you need help with that, you can see me after the service or reach out to me and I'd be happy to show you. Still having the noon Zoom prayer meeting at 12 o'clock Monday through Saturday. If you'd like uh, a Zoom link, you can reach out to Pastor or Sammy. They'll make sure to get you a, an invitation or you can join via Facebook. Blood drive coming up July 16th, and there's another one coming up September 3rd, 
and you can register for that at redcrossblood.org, and you can look up the name of the church, the zip code here in Galloway, and make your appointment. They're pretty good about sending you reminders the day of, a couple days before your appointment is set, and um, uh, it's always helpful for that. So July 16th, September 3rd, and for those that are watching on home, um, you can find the ways to give online through our website, jerseyshorebaptist.com. There's a giving link, a, t- a text to give number, and um, you can mail in your offerings, and we have the offering box right on the back of the church there, right by the map. And I'll just take this time now to uh, praise the Lord and thank him for his goodness and how good he's been to us during this time. Lord, we thank you, God, for meeting the needs of the church, Lord, and God, just um, how good you've been, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you, God, that we've been able to pay the missionaries, Lord. And God, uh, we just give you all the glory, all the honor and praise for that, Lord. We pray that you would just continue to meet the needs of the church, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just use your people, Lord, to support um, this local church here, Lord, and we thank you, God, for the church, Lord, and how long it's been here, Lord, and the lighthouse that it is for you here in Galloway, and I pray, God, that you would just continue to have your hand on our church, pray, God, that you would be with the remainder of the service, be with pastor as he preaches, Lord, I pray, God, that you would give us a nugget of truth, Lord, that will help us, that will challenge us from your word. God, we love you, we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 23. Praise the Lord. We finished Luke chapter 22. I think we'll be in Luke chapter 23 for a little while also because it's, uh, it's, it's another long chapter. And um, this one's 56 verses, not quite as long as Luke uh, 22 was, but uh, it's, it's pretty long nonetheless. And um, here's what we're going to do. This is a... Um, um, it's just uh, it's one of those passages of scripture like like we did uh, the same thing in the last chapter, and I, and I determined in the beginning of this Luke study that I wasn't going to do this, but I I kind of um, uh, I really have no other choice because there are so many different aspects to these events that each one of the gospel writers they each bring their unique perspective to it, and each one of them include information that the other one doesn't include and so I determined that I was going to kind of let Luke stand by itself but this is such a familiar story when I when I say story obviously I don't mean you know story in the fictitious sense but it's it's something that you're very familiar with and I'm very familiar with because you know since you were a little child even before you were saved you knew the story of uh, Christ's crucifixion, and you watch the Easter story, and so there's so many different bits and pieces of information going on in your mind, and so it really it's kind of important for us to kind of uh, put it together uh, chronologically and also piece together, uh, you know, do a synopsis from all the different gospel accounts. And so when we finally get there, and we'll get there soon enough, um, we're going to Again, we're going to put the scriptures up on the screen, and it'll probably be easier for you to just follow along that way. And um, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna look at John, and then we're gonna look at Luke, and we're gonna we're gonna be skipping around, kind of all over the place, piecing them uh, together as best as we can. And uh, I think you know you'll be able to at least get a quick glimpse. And again, if you want the notes, you go to the website. On if you go to the more up at the top, the more tab, you'll see uh, sermon notes, uh, media, something. What does it say on there, Mr. Wade? Sermon audio. sermon audio. And then there's sermon notes, and you can click on that, and you can get the notes. They're all on there, and you can, you can follow along with us. And so, uh, and at the top of this, this lesson, um, I have the chronological order of events with all of the different gospel accounts. Uh, for instance, okay, uh, beginning with the Last Supper, down through the crucifixion. So 
the Last Supper, the, that's the first event um, in, this, in this particular list of events. And it's Matthew 26, 26 through 29, Mark 14, 22 through 25, Luke 22, 14 through 23. So it, it carries all of the events in every place that, that this event is spoken of in the scripture. It has it all on there. And it's very helpful. And, and we're in a situation also on Sunday evenings now studying 2 Samuel where we're same thing. We have... Uh, we have these events we're looking at, and it's it's important to kind of piece together what Chronicles has to say about it as well. And sometimes the Psalms deals with the same event, and you piece together all that information to get a more accurate and complete story. So anyway, in on this list, and there are 26 events that take place between the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. Uh, we're actually in event 17, if, you, if you're following along on the, on the list through 21. And it begins with Jesus' first appearance before Pilate, and then he appears before Herod, then he appears before back again before Pilate, and, um, and then he's mocked and beaten and sentenced, and then, he's, uh, then it's the journey to Golgotha. So we're going to be dealing with that entire, uh, that, that entire section. Now, here's what we're going to do, though. Um, Matthew's gospel includes something that Ma that that um, that Luke doesn't have at all. So you gotta. I told you to turn to Luke twenty three, but just keep your your hand here and go back to Matthew chapter twenty seven, and we want to look at something real quick out of Matthew's gospel that only Matthew deals with. Um, Luke doesn't deal with this at all, and so we know that Ju Judas betrayed him. We know that Judas. Um, you know, Jesus prophesied at the Last Supper, what thou doest, do quickly. And, and um, you know, Judas left in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying. And when he gets done praying, um, Judas comes with the soldiers. We studied that last week. And so we know, but what happens to Judas? Now, most of us know what happened to Judas because, again, it's a story that we're familiar with uh, growing up. But let's just look at the passage of Scripture that deals with that. And again, it's only one passage of scripture. One of the four gospels deals with it or even mentions what happens to Judas. And, uh, and then it's mentioned again uh, later on. But we need, to, we, need, we need to look at it real quick. Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to look at verse 62. Um, or no, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew 27 and verse 3. I don't know why, where I'm getting... Uh, um, where I'm getting 62. Uh, so anyway, Matthew 27, let's begin, just, let's begin reading verse 1. It says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And we covered that last week. You know, he went to, um, the, the, the soldiers brought him to Annas, then to Caiaphas, and then he went to the Sanhedrin. And so here it records that. Um, to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, notice this, when he saw that he was condemned, Jesus was condemned, repented himself and brought again 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Now, let me just stop there and, and, and say this. How many of you would be honest enough to admit, I know I struggled with this for a while, the terminology there kind of leads you to a place where you almost want to believe that Judas got saved because it says he, he uses the word repent and, you know, and he felt bad about what he had done. Now, repentance isn't always sorrow. Godly sorrow leadeth to repentance. But we know that Esau found no place of, repent, uh, found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So he had tears but no repentance. Godly sorrow often brings people to repentance. I think Judas was both sorry, but I think he and he, I think he repented, but he didn't repent and turn to Christ for forgiveness of his sins and salvation. And I'll give you a couple other verses that kind of prove that. So anyway, but he repented of the fact that he had betrayed innocent blood. And they said, the, the people that gave him the money, the chief priests and the rulers, the people that set them all up, and they said, what is that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple. So the pieces of silver that he was paid to betray Jesus, he throws them down. And, um, 
departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they, the children of Israel, did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. So, you know, you have this strange story, he, he, and you, you almost feel bad for Judas. And listen, I, I, I feel bad for Judas. Judas was a, a sinner just like everybody else. He was human just like everybody else. He wasn't a devil. He may become a devil later on somehow, um, and we'll explain that also. But, um, you know, he, he made a, a really, really bad choice, and I believe that he could have gotten saved even after he betrayed the Lord. I believe, you know, when the Lord called him friend, uh, wherefore friend art thou come, I think he could have got saved. And so, um, you know, the Apostle Paul got saved, and he was... Uh, he killed Christians. And so, um, you know, salvation was possible for him. But his repentance wasn't to salvation. Um, he was sorry, and I, he was sincerely sorry, because that he realized that Jesus was innocent of what they were charging him with. And so he brought them to Jesus, but I don't think he knew what they were going to do. And they were going to kill him. And they were going to bring him before Pilate on trumped-up charges. And he knew what they were going to do, and he felt bad about it. And so, uh, anyway, now, here's some reasons why I'm going to just contend with anybody who thinks that, that perhaps uh, Judas was saved. Judas wasn't saved. Um, Judas is called in the Bible the son of perdition. Jesus calls him that. That word perdition is a very, very strong word. Um, it, it's the word apalia in the Greek, and it means destruction or damnation. If you were to do a search on that Greek word and look and see where that's used, it, I mean, in Revelation where it says they'll go into perdition, that's the word that's used. So it's, it's, it's talking about hell here. It's, it's, and he calls him the son of perdition. Um, and the verse is John 17 and verse 12. Um, Jesus praying to his father, he said, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, that, and uh, those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that's a reference to Judas. By the way, the only other person that is called the son of perdition, the word perdition is used many times in the, in the New Testament. Um, but matter of fact, it's, it's used for different things like waste. The word waste is the, the word uh, perdition, or a, not? It's uh, it's translated waste, but it's the same Greek word apalia. But the only other person that's referred to in the scriptures as the son of perdition in the Bible is Antichrist. He's the only other person that is given that title, and that's in Second Thessalonians chapter two. The apostle Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, they had some confusion about the end times, and. It says there, it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Some people believe that Judas is actually the Antichrist, that somehow Judas, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how they get it, that he's the Antichrist. I, I believe he's a type of the Antichrist, but he's called the son of perdition. There are only two people in the Bible called the son of perdition. Peter says, by the way, in Acts chapter 1, when they're picking a, a, a replacement apostle for Judas, he says that this apostle is going to take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. That's weird, that he might go to his own place. Why would, it's just a weird way to word it. What place did he go to? Some people believe like, you know, like Elijah and Enoch, they're somewhere. Uh, they were translated up into heaven in body that somehow Judas is being reserved somewhere. I know Antichrist just come up out of the earth, you know, the, the, the dragon, the beast that comes up out of the earth or out of the sea. Um, but anyway, by the way, Judas is also the only person 
in the Bible that was personally possessed by Satan. We talk about devil possession. You know, you know that kid's got the devil in them, not the devil. They may have a devil in them, but not the devil. There's only two people in the Bible that Satan personally possessed. And one of them was Judas, and the other one is Antichrist. They're the only two. So just some interesting correlations between the two. But he didn't get saved, and that's the point I'm trying to make. And that happens, at least most people believe it happened, right? Because in Matthew's chronology, and Matthew doesn't always go in chronological order, in Matthew's chronology, it's, it's sandwiched right here in this section of Scripture. So here, now we're going to deal with, um, you know, Jesus appearing before Pilate and then Herod, and then Pilate again, and then he gets sentenced, and he gets sent off to go to, um, to the cross. And we're not going to actually get to the cross tonight, but we'll, we'll get right up to it. So let's look at the characters. We're going to deal with different characters in this. We're dealing with politicians. We got the politicians would be uh, Pilate and Herod. Herod is, is kind of a, a, a convert over to Judaism, but he's not a... Uh, he's not a, a Jew by blood. He's actually, the Herodian dynasty came from the uh, Idumean kingdom, the Edomites. And uh, they, um, they were given a special place of privilege by, by Caesar. And they're kind of like given governorship over parts of Palestine. And so they're ruling, but they're under the authority of the Roman Empire, the Herods. And there were many different Herods. We actually did a study on the Herods. Uh, but Herod is there. Herod's son, by the way, um, is actually a pretty good guy. Uh, he's the guy that Paul the Apostle said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, he said to the Apostle Paul. So um, the last Herod wasn't that bad, but they were all pretty rotten people. Herod the Great, the guy that killed the two-year-olds, all the two-year-olds, uh, he was really brut uh, ruthless. He killed half of his family, his children, his wives. He killed everybody and uh, just brutal people. But anyway, so we have politicians, and then we have the priests and the religious leaders, and then we have the common people, and they're all acting uh, and deciding the fate of the Lord Jesus. Now, here's what happens in this case. The priests, the religious people, influence the common people, and if enough of the common people start screaming and hollering, that gets the attention of the politicians, and that's what we see happening in our world today. If... I guarantee you the politicians today wouldn't be making the decisions they're making if there weren't a lot of people screaming, yelling, and hollering. So when enough people scream and yell and holler, they have to make them happy. They have to appease them somehow. And so the Jews, the religious leaders incite the Jews. Now keep in mind, just a couple of days prior to this, they said, Hail, he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed, Hosanna to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to they They saw... They, they hailed Christ as the coming king just a couple of days prior to this when he entered the city in the triumphal entry. But now they're all crying crucify, and it's the religious leaders that are provoking them to do that. And uh, they're provoking them, and enough of them, get it. now Herod and Pilate have to do something about it. Now Pilate, who doesn't want to have anything to do, his wife said, have nothing to do with this just man um, because she had you know, had a vision, a dream about him, but, but because of the pressure the people are putting on him, he goes against what he wants to do. Some people believe that Pilate got saved later in life. They, they believe his wife definitely got saved, um, but they believe Pilate got saved. And um, so, but anyway, Pilate delivers him uh, to death. So here we go. We have the um, first appear appearance before Pilate. And we'll begin in, in Luke chapter 23. But again, I'm going to be bouncing around. So if you want to just follow the, the scriptures here in Luke, and then we're going to look up at other scriptures on the screen. And we're only going to look at one right away from Luke. Luke 23 and verse 1. It says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. Now there's a lot of stuff that happens that John records that Luke doesn't record. The other gospels don't record. And so we're going to go up to the screens now and look at the next verse. It's John 18, 28. We're going to read down through John 18, 32. It says there, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, 
And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. The judgment hall, they called it the pavement. It was the place where Herod would, or uh, Pilate would receive people and he would give his judgment. Um, and by the way, this notice it was before that they might eat the Passover. So the religious leaders, we studied it last week, they, they send them to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin makes a judgment. They're sending them now to the political authority. They couldn't do anything to Jesus on their own. They had to have permission from the Roman government to do anything to him. So they got to bring him to Pilate. Pilate's got to condemn him to death. And they're bringing him to Pilate. They bring him to this judgment hall, to the, to the pavement. They bring him there. And, um, and it was before the Passover. Now, they didn't go in themselves because they would have been ceremonially defiled because of their contact with Gentiles. And according to the scriptures, it says they weren't going to be able to eat the Passover. Now, some people who try to make the Last Supper, when did the Last Supper happen? It was the night before, right? The Last Supper then could not have been the Passover. They wanted to eat the Passover. They wanted to not be defiled. The only best way I can say to explain it that kind of makes sense is it's kind of like Christmas Eve is not Christmas. It's not Christmas Day. But a lot of times people get together on Christmas Eve and do things on Christmas Eve. And that's what Jesus and the disciples did. They were kind of preparing for the Passover, but it wasn't the Passover. No mention of lamb anywhere in that meal uh, that, they, that they eat together. And so, um, anyway, so that's verse 28. And then verse 29, Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If you were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So, Pilate realizes these people want, they want blood. Um, they can't put him to death. They want Pilate to condemn him. And he's like, well, you know, what did he do? Um, and then notice this in verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. And by the way, in, in John chapter 12, verse 32 and 33, there's a similar statement made. Jesus said this about the death that he would die. He said this, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth. Remember what illustration he was using? Does anybody remember that? What was he using the illustration from the Old Testament? He was talking about the serpent. Remember Moses' serpent in the wilderness? They were getting bit by them fiery serpents and they were all dying. And, and God told Moses, make a brazen serpent. And he put that serpent up. And um, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then he said this, he said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth. So he's pointing back to Moses' brazen serpent. All they had to do is look, by the way, look and live. And we sing that song, look and live. They only had to look to the Savior and live. They only had to look to the serpent of his living. People only have to look and put, put their faith in Christ, and they'll have eternal life. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This, he said, signifying what death he should die. By the way, another argument against extreme Calvinism, Calvinism would deny that God speaks at all to anybody, but clearly the cross was a way for God to draw all men. He said, I will draw all men unto me. The word of God, another thing that draws men to him, creation. There's all kinds of ways God draws people to him in a general way. I will draw all men unto me. And he, and he said, this he said, signifying what death he should die. So same thing that was said in John 18, 32, signifying what death, so it connects it. Now we're back in Luke chapter 23 and verse 2. And it says, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. 
So now they're trying to make the connection. They're trying to prove the case that this guy is a danger to the Roman government. He's a threat to the Roman government. He's making himself a king, and they're going to actually scream out in the process of this, we have no king but Caesar, which, boy, that is a blasphemous statement. If they would have said, Caesar is our king, and, you know, you could, make, you could justify that and say, well, you know, he's our secular king, but God is our king. But they said, we have no king but Caesar, God, that, that Caesar is our only king. And so this is significant because they had to convince Pilate that Jesus was a threat to Caesar, not just a problem for the Jews. That would not have been enough for them to condemn Jesus to death. He had to prove, they had to prove to him that he was a threat somehow to the Roman Empire. And the Jews could not put a man to death legally. They, they, but they would illegally later on, just a few months from now, um, stone Stephen to death without permission. And so they'll be at, begin to act on the sly. Um, by the way, look at, uh, take your Bible and look at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. I know we're kind of bouncing around a little bit here, but Acts chapter 18. And look at verse 12 about what politicians are willing to do. We're, we're seeing a lot of politicians these days. Acts chapter 18 and verse 12. Look what it says there. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia. Achaia is the southern portion of Greece. That's where Corinth and Athens and uh, Sincrea and Sparta are. All that southern part, Paul went there on his missionary journey. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. So the secular authority, authority is saying, look, I'm not going to judge some religious dispute that you're having. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. Notice this. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And, uh, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while and then took his leave of the children and sailed thence into Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head and saying, Korea, for he had a vow. And so, but the politician wants to do whatever will make the most people happy. And if he can keep the people happy, he can retain his power. A principled politician, on the other hand, does what is right. And Galileo, he's not going to, they're pushing him, they're pressuring him, but he's not bending. He's like, I got nothing to do with it. That's your deal. You, you deal with it in your way, but don't try to force me to get involved in it. But most politicians, they'll bend to whatever the public pressure is. All right, go back to Luke chapter 23 and verse 3. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews, speaking to Jesus? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the, and that's like saying, well, you said it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Now we're going back to John's gospel in John chapter 18. Now, normally you wouldn't do this. You'd just be reading straight through a portion of scripture, but we're piecing them together, trying to attempt to get a chronological order here. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto them, art thou the king of the Jews? So that's where we just were in, in Luke 23. Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? So John gives us a little bit more detail. Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. So that's where Luke said, he said, Thou sayest it. Well, here's where he said it in John also. Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, Notice this a second time. I find no fault at all. I find in him no fault at all. But you have a custom. So he's trying to get out of this. He, he wants to release somebody. 
and he, he, he's, he's got Barabbas in jail, but he figures there's no way they're going to want Barabbas. The Jews hate Barabbas. And, um, but there's no way they're going to they're gonna have him. But you have a custom that I should release unto you. One, at the Passover, it was a tradition. Free somebody from the prison. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Notice this. Then cried they all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. And notice Barabbas was a robber. Now, Luke's going to give us a little bit more detail regarding that. Um, verse 5 in, in Luke ch chapter 23. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning uh, from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. So now he sends them to Herod, because Herod, his jurisdiction was over Galilee. And he said, Okay, well, since you're, see, he's trying to avoid this. He's passing the buck, he's sending it to another court. I don't want to deal with this. So he sends it to Herod. And he, and he sends them off to Herod to see if Herod's going to make a decision. Look at verse 7. And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he had hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Yeah, show us a couple card tricks, Jesus. Let me see what you can do. Then he questioned with him in many words, but notice this. This guy, Jesus doesn't answer his questions at all. Now, I want you to think about this a little bit. I mean, we don't know for sure. But Pilate, he's kind of open-hearted about this thing. Pilate, uh, you know, his wife tells him, listen, I had a dream about this guy. Have nothing to do with this just man. Pilate knows the Jews, the Bible's very clear, that for envy that they brought Jesus. In other words, they were threatened by him. He knew that there was something about this guy. Jesus is talking to him. He's communicating. He's answering his questions. He knows he's going to die. He, he, he set the whole event up. But he's communicating with Pilate probably based on what the decision Pilate's going to make down the road. Think about that. But Herod, he doesn't even give Herod the time of day. He doesn't even acknowledge him. He, he answers him not a word. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war, notice this, now they start making fun of him, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And notice this, in the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together for before they were at enmity. So they had a beef between the two of them. But because Pilate sent him over, they, they made peace about that. Now he gets sent back. And we're going to begin reading in verse 13. He gets sent back to Pilate. Notice this, and we'll read straight through this. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof you accuse him. So he's, he doesn't want to have anything to do with this. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore, notice this, he, he figures he's going to meet him halfway. I will chastise him and release him. Well, we'll beat him, and you'll be satisfied with that. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And uh, they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas. So now we got more detail on Barabbas. And Luke really is the only one that fills in all the pieces on this and tells us more about Barabbas. It says, who for, uh, for a certain sedition made in the city, notice this, and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate therefore willing to release Jesus spake again to them, but they cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third, third time, why? What evil hath he done? I have no, find no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them him, notice this, that for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. So they release a murderer and they let and, they, and they, they sentenced Jesus for crucifixion. Just insane. And, and, and by the way, don't try to make sense 
of people who are just completely acting in the flesh. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff going on out there that you see going on, it's, it's, it's not just the flesh unleashed, it's demonic. Satan is, is prodding people along with his agenda. And he'll be coming for us soon. Mark it down. I hope it's not too soon. Uh, I kind of hope I get out of here before it happens, but it may be sooner than we think. And then the question is, is are we going to be like Jesus who, who doesn't say a word, who just takes it and accepts the will of God, or are we going to cave in? And it's going to be interesting to see what happens. All right, quickly, we're going to go to John chapter 19, and we're almost done. We're just going to read through these scriptures. John chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put, him, uh, in, uh, put on him a purple robe. Now, technically, that could have been those two verses before they sent him to Pilate, but we're not, or Herod, we're not really sure. And said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was, notice this, the more afraid. He was afraid. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not? I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Matthew's gospel in verse 27 and verse 19 says this, When he was set down at the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Matthew gives us that little nugget of truth. And that possibly could have happened later. Pilate's wife is traditionally thought to have been converted to Christianity sometime after this. She certainly had a fear of Christ. She is thought to be the Claudia that's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.21. Some people think that that's her. Uh, John 19.13, or 19.12. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha, and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And again, I'm just, I know this is kind of overlapping, but just to give you the different nuggets of truth included in each one of these. Matthew 27, 24, the Bible says, When Pilate said that he could prevail nothing, said that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult, a riot was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, notice this, his blood be on us and on our children. You know, you think about that. And, and please don't, I, I'm not any kind of an authority on this, but you think about that statement they made, and then you think about things like the Holocaust. His blood be upon us and on our children. Boy, I tell you what, we need to be careful. Some of the decisions we make and some of the things we say, it's not just us, it's our children that are affected. And uh, we may make decisions in our life today. We may decide, well, we're done with God. We're going to walk away from God. And for generations to come, it may mean perdition for our grandchildren. It's a, it's a, it's a very powerful thing. Um, then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. That's John 19, 16. Now we're going to go to Mark's gospel. In Mark 15, 16, and the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. 
And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him and bowing their knees, worshiping him. Now, going to Golgotha. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple, uh, purple from him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one, Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And again, they're, they're the ones that give us this little tidbit of truth, Mark's gospel. And as they led him away, they, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian. Now, Luke doesn't tell us about his kids coming out of the country, and on them they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, Cyrene, by the way, is a city in northern Libya on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And there seems to be many Jews or Jewish proselytes from that area. So this guy from Cyrene was either a Jew or he was a Jewish proselyte, um, you know, an African from Libya that came up. Uh, just like the Ethiopian eunuch was a, a Jewish proselyte as well. Now back to Luke, Luke uh, 23, 27. And uh, there followed him a great company of people and a woman, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. And of course, the, the Jews went through many, many periods like that where they were persecuted to that extent, but they have a real big one coming up in the tribulation period. And, you know, it says, you know, G Jesus said, flee. And, uh, you know, he said during that time period, it's going to be a horrible time for people with families and things like that. Verse 30, then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death and then Mark 15 and verse 22 says, and they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is interpreted the place of a skull. Golgotha is a Hebrew word that means skull, though nowhere does the text explain uh, why the place bore that name. Now, there is a place, if you go to a place called Gordon's Calvary in Israel, there is a place that looks a little bit, it has the appearance of a skull, but uh, the guides in Israel be quick to point out that... Uh, that there's another possible site uh, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which may be the place. We do not know the exact place where our Lord was crucified, and it really isn't important that we do know uh, where he was crucified. We know he was crucified, crucified outside the city walls in a place of rejection. In Hebrews, by the way, chapter 13 and verse 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And then the, the writer of the Hebrews, I believe it was Paul, said this. He said, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Meaning sometimes when you have to stand for the Lord, you're going to be outside the gate, outside the camp. Standing for the Lord is not always the most popular thing. The popular people are inside the camp. It's outside the camp where you have to stand. And uh, he, he says, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So our Lord endured all of that shame and pain alone. Think about that. Are we willing to bear the reproach of Christ alone if that's what's going to be necessary in this time that we're living in? And we're already seeing a lot of churches are caving, a lot of preachers are caving. The pressure's out there. You will, you will conform to what we want you to say, what we want you to believe, or, or we will destroy you. And a lot of people are caving. Pray that I don't cave. Pray that I stay. I don't want to be obnoxious or anything. I'm not looking for a fight, but pray that we as a church stand for the truth no matter what. All right, we're done. And we're late. Sorry about that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we pray, God, that you bless. Help us to consider some of these. We certainly read a lot of scripture. And God, I pray you'd help us to consider some of these verses and, and apply them and help us to, to meditate upon them and, and realize, God, all that you went through for us. And we love you, Father. We pray you bless. Give us safety as we travel home now. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.